Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We uh, want to wish Doug a speedy recovery, and I'm sorry he's not able to be with us here this morning, and Linda and Daniel, but uh, we know they're watching on YouTube. Doug, we love you and hope you get better soon, and we're so <laughs> grateful to have Doug and Linda working with us uh, here at uh, Cold Harbor Road. I want to welcome our visitors. We are grateful that you are here and uh, uh, very thankful that you've uh, come our way this morning. You can tell a lot by a, about a person by their hands. And we have some here today that work with their hands a lot. They maybe work in construction or uh, HVAC, the HVAC industry, uh, other mechanical kinds of things, and they're outside working with their hands, or maybe they're inside working with their hands a lot. And if you look at their hands this morning, you'll probably see uh, calluses and rough spots and things like that. And uh, others work in maybe an office environment or at a computer. Their hands don't take the beating that some other uh, that others do. But you can tell a lot by looking at a person's hands. My dad uh, was a machinist and uh, worked with his hands a lot and owned a small machine tool. A company and there were many times that I can remember growing up that my mom and dad would have a conversation that went like this. Dad would come home at night and my mom would say, Ed, can't you get your hands any cleaner? There's still oil and grease under your fingernails. And dad would say, Bonnie, I've tried but I just can't get them clean. <laughs> So I'll go back and try harder. So maybe some of you ladies have had similar conversations with your husbands, perhaps, and you can relate to that. But you can tell a lot by looking at someone's hands. And so this morning, we can learn a lot about our Lord and Savior by looking at his hands also, as they are portrayed for us in Scripture. And so that's what we want to focus on this morning, the hands of the Master, because in... Uh, in, a, uh, in a spiritual sense and really in a, uh, uh, a, a, a literal sense, our, our lives are in the hands of God through Jesus. And looking at the hands of the master uh, will help us to understand more fully who Jesus is, who the master is, what he wants for us in our life and his, his will for us and how to live more faithful and obedient lives. And so that's what we want to look at this morning, the hands of the master. It would help if I go forward. There we go. Uh, let's see. I was right. Ron, help me out here. Hands of the master. Okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, they didn't have these technical problems in the first century when they were <laughs> preaching and teaching. So three major things we want to look at this morning. And the first one is this. The hands of the master are strong hands. The hands of the master are strong hands. Jesus, being growing up, was the son of a carpenter. Joseph was a carpenter. And so Jesus would have been would have spent a lot of time in his father's carpenter shop in Nazareth. Carpentry is hard work, and it uh, requires very strong hands. And so Jesus would have been very familiar with working with wood and fashioning the boards and the, uh, the, the, the beams that went into the buildings there in Nazareth. And so in doing that, he would have strong hands. It was known that Jesus, of course, was a carpenter in his uh, growing up. And when he began his 
uh, his earthly ministry, the people in Nazareth and the surrounding areas were amazed at his wisdom, and they said, they said this, is this not the carpenter's son? The carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us also? And so Jesus would have had strong hands, as physical hands, as a result of working in the carpentry shop there with his father. And he used these strong hands throughout his ministry. There's many examples we could cite, but one is... Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 14, where the disciples are in a storm in a boat on the, the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus comes walking to them. We, we know this story, and uh, Peter sees Jesus walking to, uh, walking to him. Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter calls out, and he says, Lord, let me come to you. And, and Jesus says, come. And so Peter gets down out of the boat, and he starts to walk on the water, towards Jesus. But we know that scripture tells us when Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he began to sink. And look at what scripture says here. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And so let's put ourselves in Peter's position at this point. He's, he is, the, the, the wind is raging, the storm, the, the, the waves are crashing, the, the storm is roaring all around him, and he's doing okay, he's doing, he's walking on the water, he's walking toward Jesus, but he loses his focus, and he begins to sink in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the deep lake there, the Sea of Galilee, and just imagine the feelings of fear and helplessness as he begins, as he begins to sink. But then, just imagine the feeling of relief and gratefulness when he looks up and the strong hand of the master is reaching down to save him. And so Peter could, could with all confidence, reach out and grab onto that hand, that strong hand there of the master, knowing that it was going to save him, it's going to pull him up, and, uh, and, and it was going to help him. And in a like sense, we today, through his word, uh, through, the, through scripture, can reach out to the strong hand of Jesus in times of our trouble. The Apostle Paul also, uh, in, in times of his need, understood the, the, the strength that comes from the strong hand of, of Jesus. And in the last uh, days of Paul's life, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he's Paul is telling Timothy about these the, the sheer series of trials that Paul is going through. There is a Roman; he's or in the Roman um, uh, courts there in Rome, and Paul knows that he is about to die. And he tells he tells Timothy, he said, "At my first defense, no one stood with me, or all forsook me. May it not be charged to them." But notice what he says: "But the Lord stood with me and strengthened." And so the Apostle Paul could also see and know the strength of uh, the presence of, of God through Christ and the strong figurative hands of the Master there for him. And it's the same as we said for us. In times of our need, in times of our trouble, in times of our stress, in times of our uh, danger, in times of our fear, uh, in times of our grief, all of those things, the strong hands of the master are there reaching out to us through scripture to help us. And the question is, how effectively are we taking advantage of that? We sang a song just before the, the lesson, uh, uh, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. And that's a, that's a familiar song to, to many of us. But did you... Uh, notice the verses, and do we, do we pay attention? Verse 1 says, Time is filled with swift transition, naught of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal, and then note, hold to God's unchanging hand. And then the second verse says, Trust in him who will not leave you whatsoever years may bring. 
if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. That's not scripture, but that's powerful. But this is scripture. Look at what the Hebrew writer says. In Hebrews 13, he says, For he himself has said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. The Lord, is, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? For he himself has said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. The strong hands of the master are there reaching out to us in our time of need where we need for our help, for our assistance, for our, um, for our care as he helps us through the struggles that we have in life. The hands of the master are strong hands. Secondly to this morning, the hands of the master are tender hands. The hands of the master are tender hands. In the Old Testament, Israel constantly uh, is turning away from God, is constantly rebelling against God, is constantly uh, being disobedient to, to God. And yet God, through, uh, through the prophets, reaches out continually, patiently, tenderly to, the, to Old Testament Israel. And through the, the prophet Hosea, he paints a picture, a very beautiful picture, of a father helping his little child to walk by taking this child by the arms and tenderly helping him to learn to walk. That's the, the picture of God the Father to Old Testament Israel. And notice what, notice what, uh, what uh, Hosea says. He says, God through Hosea says this. He says, I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. They did not know it was I who healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. I was to them as to those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. It takes tender hands to teach a young child how to walk. And you parents know that, to take their little arms and help them to walk as they're learning how to walk. It takes tender hands to do that. It takes tender hands to stoop and to feed, uh, to feed a child. And that is the picture of, of the, uh, the tender hands of the master in the Old Testament. There's, in the Gospels, the example of Jesus' tender hands are also evident everywhere throughout, throughout Jesus' ministry. And in Luke chapter 8, the, the account of uh, Jesus is there, he's, he's teaching, and a man named Jairus comes to him and says, my little daughter is, uh, is sick and is, almost, uh, is near death, is almost ready to die. Can you come to my house and heal her? So Jesus starts to go. There's a crowd following him. But on the way, word comes to Jairus that your daughter has died. And so no need to trouble the master anymore. And so Jesus, though, continues on to Jairus' house. And he arrives there. And there's a large crowd of mourners around the house. And uh, he, they are, they are weeping and mourning because the child is dead. And Jesus said, the child is not dead. She's just sleeping. And the text says the crowd ridiculed him because they could see that the young child was dead. And yet, Jesus then went into the house and uh, put everyone out of the house except for uh, uh, Peter, James, and John and the, the, the child's parents. And scripture records for us this. Jesus then took her by the hand and cried, saying, little girl, arise. Called out saying, little girl, arise. And then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. 
let's put ourselves in the room there with this little girl and her parents. And the, the two parents are standing there distraught. They, are, they believe their little child is dead. And Peter, James, and John are there too. And then the little girl is laying there. She's dead. But the tender hands of the master take this little girl's hand in, her, in his hands and say, little girl, arise. And she arose. And she arose. It takes a tender hand to take a little child's hand and bring them back to life. A tender, caring hand. It takes hands that are gentle that want to heal, that want to help and not hurt, those are the tender hands of the master. And it's important to note that you and I have a lot in common with both of these examples that we have, <clears throat> that we have mentioned. The, the, it, we are like, in some ways, in our life, Old Testament Israel. We are frequently rebellious. We are obstinate. Uh, we often uh, do not, um, are not thankful like we should be, and yet the hands of the master are tender with us. We often, we've been blessed like Old Testament Israel was uh, so abundantly, and yet we're not uh, often aware of those, uh, enough of those blessings, and yet the hands of the master are tender with us. And like this little girl, we are, outside of Christ, we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually dead. But through his word, Jesus gives us life. He tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 63, the words that I say to you, they are spirit and they are life. And he says further in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And so it's that's the... That's the, the, the goal of the tender hands of, of Jesus. And outside of Christ, though, as we said, we are, all, we are all spiritually dead. Jesus said this, Therefore I say to you, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You will die in your sins. But that's not the, that's not the goal of, of God at all. As we know, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to give us life, spiritual life through his son. And indeed, the signature verse of Luke, chapter 19 and verse 10, summing up uh, why Jesus came, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The tender hands of the Master reach out to us to give us life and to help us hands that are gentle hands that will help to heal and hands that are there to love us and so so far we've seen the hands of the master are strong hands they're strong hands the hands of the master are tender hands but our third and final major point this morning, importantly, the hands of the master are scarred hands. They are scarred hands. As we said, growing up, Jesus would have been very familiar with the feel of wood in the carpentry shop in Nazareth. He would have spent you know, many hours running his hands over the smooth wood of the finished boards and planks there as they were ready to be used for construction and, and building the houses in Nazareth. He was very familiar with the feel of the wood in his early days, in his early years. But on the last day of his life, on the last day of his life, the hands of the master would feel the wood again. They would feel the wood again, and they, this time it would not be the, the smooth uh, 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 boards, the, the, the sleek boards of the carpentry shop in Nazareth. No, they would not be that kind of wood. 
this time on the last day of his life, the wood that the hands of the master would feel would be the heavy, rugged, rough, splintered wood of a Roman cross. The hands of the master, that's the wood that he would feel. The, the, the strong hands and the tender hands of the master that wanted only to help and heal through his life would feel the, 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 the rough and rugged wood of a, of a heavy Roman cross. And as, as he was carrying this cross on his back, which was an instrument of his own death, through the streets of Jerusalem, he had, he had been scourged the night uh, just previous to that. He was weak. This piece of cross that he was carrying was about 100 pounds, if you can picture that. And we can picture Jesus stumbling through the streets, trying to carry this cross, falling down, trying to get up, not able to do that. And a frustrated Roman guard, we can could, we could just picture the scene. Uh, saying, get up, get up, move faster, keep going, and he can't, he can't. And so scripture tells us that uh, they, now they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And so we could just picture you there, take his cross. And so Simon steps in and picks up the cross, and for a moment, the hands of the master would not feel the wood for that brief time while they made their way to Calvary. But they did go get to Calvary. And scripture records for us, there they crucified him. Roman crucifixion involved the, the victim being thrown back onto the dirt uh, and, under, and onto the cross. And so again, the hands of the master would be stretched out he would then feel again the, the wood on both his right hand and his left. And not only the wood now would the hands of the master feel, but he would also feel something else. He would feel the, 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 the piercing pain of an iron Roman nail in each wrist, in his right wrist and in his left, as he lay there on the ground. And he would then be hoisted up and hung there on the cross with these nails in each one of his wrists. The hands of the master are scarred hands. Why? Because of the nails, but more importantly, because of the great love that he has for you and for me, and so that you and I can be saved. Think about it. Think about it. The hands of the master are scarred hands. They are scarred hands for you and for me. That was 3,000, 2,000, 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Today, the hands of the master continue to reach out to you and to me. And in our text, in Revelation 3 and verse 20, Jesus said this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Through this book, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. stands at the door and knocks. And as we've seen this morning, this hand that knocks is a strong hand, it's a tender hand, but it's also a scarred hand. It's a scarred hand that knocks at the heart of you and me this morning. Please do not turn away from the knocking of the hands of the master this morning. He knocks for you and for me. And he knocks to move us to greater faithfulness. He knocks to move us to greater uh, uh, 
love. He knocks to move us to greater understanding of who he is so that you and I will be more faithful in this life, more obedient, will glorify him and bring others to him. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you've not obeyed the gospel, that hand that knocks those words, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That is for you. That knock is for you. The Bible makes it so very clear about what the hands of the master would desire of us to do to become a Christian. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, as we've seen earlier in the lesson, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, John 8, verse 24. We must repent of our sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So clear, these commandments for us. He tells us that we must confess his name publicly, that Jesus is, the, is Lord in Christ, Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 33 and 34, he said, him, He who confesses me before men, he, him I will confess before my Father in heaven. He who denies me before men, him, he I will deny before my Father in heaven. And then we are to be baptized, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Romans chapter 6, Paul writes about all of you who have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. On the day of Pentecost, when the people cried out, what shall we do? When they understood that they were the ones that put Jesus on the cross, Peter's response was, repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's so clear, the hands of the Master reach out, urging us to this invitation. And then we're also to live faithfully. Revelation 2 and verse 10, the rest of our life. The hands of the master are strong, tender, and scarred for you and for me. And as a Christian, if you've, if you've fallen away, if you need to come back, need to be restored to the church, if you need the prayers of the church for any other kind of help, that the hands of the master are reaching out to eagerly give you, as we've seen this morning. Won't you please come right now as together we stand and sing?